Good morning, everybody. I wanted to do a recap of the Jonesboro, Arkansas tornado, the meteorological setup behind it uh, this morning. This is a live severe weather briefing, and it was kind of a surprise setup, although uh, there certainly were some indicators that there were going to be tornadoes down in the southern mode of this uh, uh, storm system. And looking in hindsight, you can certainly see that there were even indicators of a strong tornado threat down in the southern mode across eastern Arkansas. Here you can see the radar imagery showing that renegade storm right here. This was the parent supercell that produced the Jonesboro tornado. And this supercell was just to the east of a larger scale precipitation sh shield. Uh, there, were, there was some a shield of convective inhibition as well, some negative buoyancy just along the eastern edge of that precipitation shield with those high clouds drifting over that environment. But it was a very moist environment as well ahead of that precipitation shield dew points around 70 temperatures rose into the upper 70s with the heating of the day out ahead of those um, uh, mid and upper level clouds that created that negative buoyancy right at the low levels and i do think that the convective inhibition just to the east of that precipitation shield was a key component to developing a, tor a strong tornado threat across northeastern arkansas another uh, factor that was at play was a pretty potent jet streak that was uh, moving across the area. It looks like uh, this location across eastern Arkansas was in the right entrance region of that jet, which is another area that can contribute to lift in the upper levels of the atmosphere that can lead to pressure falls at the low levels. And an acceleration of that low level jet certainly happened down in the southern mode. And I'm going to show you that uh, as we move, move along with a combination of weather maps, some radar imagery, soundings, and photographs. And now on the bottom right, you can see that very robust mesocyclone. This is from the Radar Omega app. Uh, this is the very large vacuum cleaner-like mesocyclone that exists in these supercell storms. Basically a tilted vacuum cleaner that goes all the way up to that tropopause. And it's that vacuum cleaner above that any candidate underneath, any eddy, any area of vorticity can be stretched into the vertical and can very quickly become a strong tornado. And when you have that very narrow layer of negative buoyancy as well at the low levels that can weaken that surface wind just a little bit, it can enhance the low level shear. And then that tornado dynamically pipes through that negative buoyancy layer. And that's why I think when I, I was watching the live streams of this tornado touching down, it came down as a pretty skinny vortex and then quickly widened out to a very uh, wide vortex, very similar to the Joplin, Missouri uh, tornado formation. I think you had that vacuum cleaner above it with intense tilted vertical motion, uh, and it just was waiting for any eddy or any uh, a vortex underneath at the apex of that RFD to get stretched into the vertical and then became a very strong tornado. And this strong tornado went around the east side of Jonesboro. It damaged a mall as well. Miraculously, only six people were injured. This would have been a much worse case scenario in terms of the uh, of the dam uh, of the damage the loss of life and property but thankfully uh, most businesses were closed across east jonesboro so even though there was mass destruction including the mall there uh, somehow uh, there was no loss of life and uh, that shows that maybe the shelter in place maybe closing these businesses during tornado days certainly could have an impact we only have a sample size of one so far of course but now let's break down the environment using this wrap analysis tool this is a short range model forecast but the analysis occurs every hour so you can get an idea of what that environment looks like there you can see that jonesboro supercell in far northeastern arkansas and this blue color here that blue hatch area that's that negative buoyancy or sin that i've been talking about so that's the opposite of cape uh, basically, if you have a balloon rising up through the atmosphere and it's colder than the surrounding temperature, it's going to sink. So that, those are the basics of negative buoyancy. Uh, this negative buoyancy existed at the very low levels of the atmosphere, and that led to a weakening of that surface wind and a backing of that surface wind. Uh, that's, uh, they became more south-southeasterly. Uh, they, they weakened as well. You could see some of these barbs here, 5 to 10 knots. Uh, out ahead of this storm and when you weaken the surface wind beneath a 40 knot low level jet that creates substantial low level shear and just a little bit of backing of a few degrees beneath that sin shield can make a big difference in the storm relative helicity within that hodograph and that's what i'm going to show you here next but first i wanted to show you the effective helicities and uh, the jonesboro tornado occurred on the very southern end of a low level shear lobe so you could see the uh, low level shear with this uh, uh, a system was about 200, zero to one kilometer storm relative helicities. So not incredibly 
it doesn't pop out as a, a, a an environment that's going to produce uh, strong, strong, strong tornadoes. You may want to target behind this precip shield where that elevated mix layer is overspreading eastern Missouri. There you've got a low level shear in excess of two to three hundred. This precipitation shield definitely cleared out a lot of the warm sector across central and uh, and southern Missouri or southern Illinois there. But on the southeastern flank of this precipitation shield, that's where you had a very moist and unstable environment, dew point of about 70. You had that negative buoyancy that uh, that developed underneath those mid and high level clouds that spread uh, that were spreading east from that precipitation shield, and you had a couple renegade supercells develop right on the eastern side of that precipitation shield, and those lifted up into a, a an environment that was characterized overall by relatively modest low level shear, but underneath that sin shield, when you do back those winds just a little bit. Uh, that storm relative helicity can really ramp up above the 200 level pretty quickly. And also we had the right entrance region of the jet and that accelerated uh, that low level jet across eastern Arkansas and I'm going to show you that as well. That can have a tendency to really enhance that storm relative helicity. Here you can see these stronger uh, f uh, uh, mid and upper level winds uh, shown by that storm motion. You can see some weaker winds out ahead of this precipitation shield. So this shield occurred right on the leading edge of much stronger winds or that jet streak and it looks like the right entrance region of that jet passed over this region that led to low level pressure falls and an acceleration of that low level jet that I'm about to show you now. But first I want to show you the VAD. This is a, a radar derived photograph from the low levels and uh, when I look at this VAD it looks just a little bit stretched out. I would see an isolated tornado threat certainly uh, if you have a storm motion out here, you've got a ton of storm relative helicity in between that uh, uh, hodograph curve and the storm motion curve. You can see that there's a lot of potential uh, for tornadoes, and that's because of that one kilometer or those low-level winds uh, ramping up to about 400 uh, or over 40 knots above 500 meters very quickly. Uh, the surface winds you can see are pretty calm below 10 knots, and they likely backed and even weakened a little bit more uh, because of that area of negative buoyancy. This VAD was from Memphis, which was just off to the east of that negative buoyancy shield, and that likely brought some of these winds in this uh, lo lower level of this photograph back to the left of the axis just a little bit, weakened them, and elongated those low-level shear vectors. But this VAD right here is decent for a tornado threat. I would certainly target this uh, if this was the best looking photograph across the warm sector. I ended up targeting central Iowa initially near the double point and then western Illinois. As those supercells developed there was some stronger shear up there but the moisture was a lot more shallow off to the north. I was looking at some of the uh, soundings in hindsight and the moisture quality in the northern mode up in Iowa and Illinois was very very shallow so it mixed out the moisture across southern Iowa ahead and just to the south of that double point. There was quite a bit of moisture in western Illinois, but some morning convection came through there, stabilized the low-level environment just a bit, so the thermodynamics weren't quite there in western Illinois. However, down in northeastern Arkansas, where uh, thermodynamics were definitely not an issue, the wind shear came together at the last second to create a strong tornado threat there across northeastern Arkansas. Here are the upper levels. Uh, this is derived from the uh, GFS, the Pivotal Weather website, an incredible website to visualize model imagery. And this is at 300 millibars to show you that jet streak structure. Here you can see the core of that jet streak. And uh, normally you'd want to focus on the left exit region of that jet streak for the most lift up there in central Iowa near that double point. That's why you had those extreme surface pressure falls, uh, the surface load uh, strengthening into the upper 980s up there. Uh, you also had the jet streak peeling off just a little bit here across west central Illinois. That provided just enough lift to get supercell storms going up there, including a few tornado reports across central and northern Illinois. But then you've got the right entrance region of that jet streak. There, that's also a source of lift at the upper levels due to the ageostrophic wind component. And you've also got to watch these right entrance regions. And uh, this right entrance region slid over the target area uh, by peak heating, and that uh, acted to accelerate that low-level jet in the vicinity of uh, the Jonesboro area. So here is the low-level jet at 18Z. This is uh, 850 millibars. 
You can see uh, the southern mode low level jet here is beginning to increase by 18Z as that right entrance region is approaching. Still though, you're talking 35 knots there uh, at 18Z, but it accelerates rapidly over the three hours after 18Z. This is the nose of the main uh, low level jet just to the east of the surface low. This is the one I was targeting as my primary target. Uh, the moisture quality was a lot less than the models were indicating a lot more shallow moisture up there in the end made it a less robust tornado threat i did see a tornado though just to the northeast of des moines and then i was able to drop south of davenport and then also get the illinois mode and intercepted that tornado worn storm that produced a tornado near cambridge a quick one i can't verify ground circulation but it was close enough to count it for me but i was able to get on that gassed up and then missed that tornado while I was filling up with gas. That's the reason why I hate filling up with gas in the middle of a storm chase. But then you can see a bit of a break in the low level jet where that precipitation shield was located and actually closer to the core of that jet streak. Really you get an enhancement in the low level jet in the left exit and then you get an enhancement in the low level jet down here in the uh, right entrance region. So now let's step forward three hours and watch this uh, a, a low-level jet down in, in, uh, near the right entrance region in eastern Arkansas ramp up. Look at that thing accelerate. That goes up to 40 knots, 50 knots. So who knows? And look at what a narrow ribbon that low-level jet also is by 21Z. So I think that the VAD there in Memphis likely did not sample this skinny low-level jet right across northeastern Arkansas that appears to have accelerated above 50 knots. So if you put a 50 knot one kilometer wind in that VAD, and I'm going to show you what that's going to do, that's going to make that VAD very favorable for strong tornado potential. And that's exactly what it did in northeastern Arkansas, even into the Missouri boot heel. I think that that tornado continued pretty close up to the Missouri border, if not into the Missouri boot heel itself. But what happened is the right entrance region passed over this area, northeastern Arkansas, of that jet streak at the upper levels. That created a vacuum cleaner up there and led to low level pressure falls just to the west and an acceleration of that low level jet. Let's zoom in just a little bit here and we can really see that narrow ribbon of an increase in northeastern Arkansas. So I think that there are a couple different factors at play. You had the negative buoyancy at the low levels that weakened the surface wind, backed it just a little bit to five to 10 knots. You also had the right entrance region sliding over this area that accelerated the low level jet across northeastern Arkansas and into the Missouri boot heel. Even a 60 knot barb there in the vicinity of that storm. Uh, and this is at zero Z. So between 21 and zero Z, that is when this low level jet really ramped up. You can see the low level jet also ramping up across southeastern Iowa into west central Illinois. But the thermodynamics just weren't in play there. They weren't, the moisture was not deep enough. And that happens a lot during these early season setups that far north. Looking at the energy helicity index, this is why you want to be careful of using these composite indices to do forecasts. Because this would normally you would target West Central Illinois. That's where all the storm chasers were. That was the energy helicity index bullseye there. You can also see a pop along the warm front in eastern Iowa where there are a cluster of tornadoes. Most tornadoes happened in Iowa yesterday than Illinois. And then you can see a little bit of a pop down there in northeastern Arkansas. But what's not included in that is that rapid acceleration of the low level jet, the SIN shield or negative buoyancy shield that was depicted by uh, the RAP analysis that was initially initialized every hour. And you likely would have also seen a bullseye down here in Northeastern Arkansas into Southeastern Missouri. Here is uh, a model derived sounding. And uh, you can see that the hodograph looks quite similar to the, one, to the VAD. So this is definitely an accurate Photograph, but this is just off to the east of that ribbon of low level jet. So if you take a 55 to 60 knot low level jet there, look what that does to the photograph. You get a crazy curved photograph with that storm motion at, at about 40 knots. You get a ton of storm relative helicity within that storm motion curve and the photograph, storm motion line and the photograph curve. And this suddenly becomes a strong tornado potential much deeper moisture look at how deep this moisture is in the sounding you got a 70 dew point going all the way up very moist little bit of a elevated mix layer uh hinted at and then if you're also backing these low level winds just a little bit as happened beneath that area of negative buoyancy 
you're increasing uh, the critical angle as well uh, to, to more of a and, and a 50 degree critical angle is more than sufficient to getting a strong tornado especially with that low level jet increasing to 50 or 60 knots plenty of strong flow aloft you likely also got rid of some of this veer back veer action there in the hodograph. And then it suddenly becomes an incredibly favorable hodograph for strong tornadoes out there. You can see a lot of lift also in this sounding on the vertical motion plot. This shows that uh, the right entrance region was beginning to slide over this area and you had a lot of lift at the mid and upper levels of the atmosphere, creating pressure falls at the lower levels, accelerating uh, that low level jet so when you dig a little bit deeper you can see that when you dig a little bit deeper you could certainly see uh, that this uh, strong tornado had the kinematics and the thermodynamics to become quite substantial and um, thankfully there was no loss of life however major major structural damage that will take certainly a long time uh, to, to recover and I was just drawing on that hodograph, but I realized that I didn't take my noggin off yet. But there you can see that hodograph on the upper right. Let me do that analysis just one more time. Try to draw on this sounding. Oh, it looks like a... Good heavens. But with that hodograph, when you superimpose a 50 knot and even 55 knot low level jet, you can see that it becomes incredibly favorable for that uh, for strong tornadoes. Looking at the VAD, there you can see the one kilometer wind of about 40 knots. So if you extrapolate that up to 55 knots, you're increasing your storm relative helicity well in excess of 300, and then that leads to that strong tornado potential. Again, looking at the radar, you can definitely see those renegades there that developed on the eastern side of the precipitation shield. So this happens quite a bit in Dixie Alley where some mesoscale, a uh, mesoscale accident can come together but also the synoptic scale jet dynamics were a big time driver of this tornado threat across northeastern Arkansas. And uh, certainly glad everybody's okay out there, but a long road of rebuilding ahead. And thank you guys for following my live briefings here. Definitely check out the Facebook supporter community. We do these meteorological breakdowns as close to every day as we can, and we're going to continue to do that moving forward. We're going to look at the long range, April 4th through 6th time period. Looks like it gets active again across the southeastern Great Plains and Dixie Alley. Also, Monday and Tuesday, there's a southern stream system that could impact portions of central southern Louisiana tomorrow night, and then uh, southern Georgia, it looks like, on, um, on, on Tuesday early afternoon, late morning, early afternoon type of a timing, but it doesn't look like a substantial tornado outbreak this system. However, it does get pretty active uh, again uh, in that first week of April. So thank you everybody for following my live streams and I hope you enjoy these meteorological breakdowns. Stay hunkered down, hang in there, and stay tuned to Watches and Warnings.